1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. Verse number 5 says this, it says, Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Um, this morning we're going to be looking about having a vision for the Lord. Um, today was kind of like our vision service. Uh, we got a chance to see the, the video presentation that Jennifer put together, and uh, she did a wonderful job. Um, and so just kind of see a little bit of what we did this year. Uh, we did a lot of things. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, I mean, so many things that we, get to, we got to do as a church for the Lord. Um, you know, all the different lives that we had an impact on, uh, just what the Lord allowed us to, to be a part of. Uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing year. Um, but instead of just dwelling on what we have done, uh, we should also look to the future about what we can do what the Lord will allow us to do. And so this morning, um, I want to talk a little bit about having a vision for the Lord. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you so much again for your love. We thank you, Lord, um, for this church. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And Father, I pray that you would just bless this message this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak to hearts. Lord, that you encourage those that, that listen. And God, that you would give us a vision. Um, Lord, not just as a church, but of us individually, um, where do we see ourselves next year? Um, what would you have us to do for this next year? And Father, I do pray that you would. Um, Lord, just uh, speak to our hearts, and we'll give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so as introduction here, as we get closer to the end of the year, most of us have probably already begun planning different things for 2017. I mean, you probably maybe have already scheduled your holidays, uh, or you're making plans of, of where you want to go, who you want to see, maybe visit family or friends next year. Um, so we, it's, it's natural to plan. It's natural to think ahead. Um, for some, maybe 2017 will be at the end of a chapter in your life. Uh, for example, you know, those who are studying for their leaving cert, uh, the next year is going to be a big year for them. It's going to be a, a, a door that's going to be closing. It's going to be a, a chapter that's going to be finishing on their secondary, in their secondary school life. No longer they have to go to, to secondary school and, and, uh, and go through that, but now, once that chapter closes, a whole new one's going to begin. Real life. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to get a job. You're going to have to learn, you know, maybe go to, to university and go to college. Um, so it's going to be a whole brand new door that's going to open to you next year. But even though we cannot see the future, it's okay to plan ahead. Planning and worrying are two different things, though. Yet both should be given to God. Turn to James. Hold your place here in 2 Corinthians. Turn to James chapter 4, verse number 13. Now, the earlier... Just last month, you know, I spoke a lot about giving, giving your worries to God in prayer. And it's really easy this next year to, to worry about what's going to happen, what's, you know, what's going to take place in 2017. And we can get so consumed by that worry that we won't enjoy the year at all. Um, and pretty soon we'll be at this time next year and we're looking back and you'll wonder, wow, what happened to my year? I didn't get to do anything that I had planned because I had worried too much about it. Look at James chapter 4, verse number 13. It says here, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So, 
As you make plans, it's okay to plan. But always be remember, if the Lord will allow it. If it's the Lord's will, I, I, I'd like to do this. Um, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's up to the Lord, then we can be able to do different things in our life. Um, so we need to give our plans, give our worries, give our fears, give them to God. Because He is the only one who can see the future. So trust Him. Trust Him with what's going to happen. I mean, trust Him with tomorrow. I mean, the Lord could come back tomorrow and we won't even have to worry about 2017. <laughs> it's, that's the possibility that we live as Christians. He could come back any time. But until that time, we still have to keep on working. We have to keep on going until the day that He does come. Because He will come. Now, it's easy to go through life um, just reacting to situations around you and not being proactive. It's easy to live without a vision. But without a vision or a goal in your life, it's hard to accomplish very much. I mean, all you do is just live day to day and, and you really don't see much done. That's why it's so important uh, to have a vision. It helps you accomplish things. It helps you to, um, to, to know that you have done something with your life. And uh, this morning, as we look at 1 Corinthians 16, I want to show an example in Scripture about how and, and about having a vision for the Lord. So if you would, turn back to chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 5 through 8 again. Paul here is writing to the Corinthian church. So in other words, he wasn't actually in Corinth at the time. He was writing a letter to them. In verse number 5, he says, Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. He's already making plans for the future. Now Paul knew and he lived that, you know what, Jesus Christ could come back any day in his lifetime. He knew that. But yet he said, you know what, I'm still going to make plans for the ministry. I'm still going to make plans to serve the Lord. And said, I'm, going to, I'm planning on going through Macedonia. Verse number 6, it says, It may be that I will abide, yea, the winter with you. He said, I might come and visit you for the winter. I don't know yet. Um, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way. He said, I'm not planning on coming, but I might. Um, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permits. If the Lord allows me to stop by and to, and to spend time with you, then... I will do so. But he says in verse number 8, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. He said, this is where I'm planning on going. I'm planning on going to Ephesus. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. So he's saying, I'm planning on going to Ephesus because God has opened up a door for me to serve him there. You see, Paul desired uh, to have a vision and we need to have a vision or purpose for our life. You need to have a desire to, 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 to do something with your life, um, to have goals, to have dreams. Because if you don't have any of those, you don't have much to look forward to in your life. It's okay to dream. It's okay to have a vision. It's okay to have goals. And we should desire to have those um, for the Lord. You see, Paul desired to serve God with his life. And to preach the gospel everywhere he went. He was hoping to see the church in Corinth if the Lord willed. If the Lord would bring him that way. But he wasn't planning on it. But he also said that he was going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because the Lord opened a door for him to minister and to preach the gospel. Uh, Jesus Christ said in the parable in Luke 19 that we as servants should occupy until he returns. Uh, now, that's a, a unique word. Occupy means to employ and to use or be used for a purpose. So when, when as he was giving that, that parable and he told the servants, he said, occupy. In other words, work until I come back. Don't just sit there, you know, with your thumbs just twiddling and saying, okay, Jesus, come back any day now. I'm waiting for you and do absolutely nothing. That's not what he was talking about. When he said when, in that parable, he was giving an illustration for us that as he is gone, when he comes back, he wants, to, when, he wants to see us doing something for him. 
He wants us to be involved in serving Him. He wants to use us for a purpose. He wants to employ us. You see, even though Jesus could return any moment, instead of sitting around and doing nothing like some of the servants that were mentioned, we should be working for the Lord and trying to do our best. Uh, that should be our desire. I mean, when, I mean, when Jesus Christ comes back, what do you want Him finding you doing? Are you going to be in your sin, doing something that you know that you shouldn't be doing? Or are you serving Him? Are you spending time with Him? See, we don't know when He's going to come back, but we do know that when He does return, it's going to be a twinkling of an eye, as, as, as quick as lightning. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, God didn't instantly take you to heaven, did He? I mean, as soon as you, became, as soon as you trusted Christ as your Savior, um, you know, God could have just took you to heaven just like that. But He didn't, did He? Because He still has a purpose for you. He still wants to use you. He still wants to, um, He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to reach others with the gospel. Because He knows that there are some people that only you can reach. See, I, there's people in your life I can't talk to. I've never met them. I may never have a, an opportunity to meet them. But you may interact with them every single day. Those may be the people that God specifically has laid on uh, in your life to be able to reach with the gospel, to warn, to preach to, to give a tract to. You see, this is what the ministry is all about. It's how we as a church family can minister not only to one another, but to those who don't know about Christ and what God has done for them. Can I ask you this morning, are you doing anything for the Lord? What are you involved in for the Lord? You see, there are so many different ministries that we do as a church. Um, I mean, these are just, these are most of them, but there's still some that I couldn't fit on the screen. Um, you know, we have the office staff, and down there we plan and prepare everything. We could always use help just work around the office. Uh, welcome ministry, just being able to stand at the door and, and welcome people to come and talk to them. Uh, 12 Weeks to Freedom, there's always a, a great need there just to, to help out there and to reach, especially doing outreach and leaflets inviting pe and people. Um, children's Church, um, Crash. we need some more Sunday school teachers or children's church teachers. We need some more. Um, we need more helpers. We need more people in the crash. Um, you know, right now we have a roster of usually the ladies who help in crash. they're usually on there about you know, two times a quarter. And, then, you know, it'd be nice even to give them a little bit more of a break if possible. Um, but this is, this is just several opportunities that, that you and I get to be a part of, that we can minister to people, not only just in our church, but in the area that we are with. Um, if you're not doing something other than coming to church on Sunday morning, ask God to put a burden for a ministry on your heart. Or just come along and help that ministry. You know what? You'd be surprised um, how much you might enjoy something when you get out and actually start doing it. Um, I remember when I first started helping out in my church back in the States, um, you know, I had just gotten saved. I didn't know nothing about Christianity, but I, I wanted to help somewhere. I just wanted to do something for God. And, um, and thankfully, some people decided to to just kind of let me be involved in some things. And uh, one of the things I used to be involved in was our uh, like a PA system back there with what, the, what Barry and Nathan are doing. And um, I didn't know nothing about PA equipment. I didn't even know how to work anything. But yet someone took the time to show me and to teach me. And you may, you may think, you know what, I don't have, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. Well, let someone come and teach you how to do it. You know? Be teachable, and, um, and you'd be surprised at how much you might actually enjoy doing something for the Lord. And uh, so don't be afraid just to come out and help. Um, over the next, uh, for the rest of the year, and also for next year, we're going to be highlighting two ministries a month. And if there's something that you'd like to help with, please let us know. Uh, we've kind of already talked a little bit about crash and the books, but uh, we're going to be talking about some more ministries over the next few months. If there's something that you'd like to do, let us know. 
because honestly, there's, there's several places that we could always use help in. We could always use more volunteers. Um, next year is going to be a great year. A uh, pastor in the church office has already been vis- busy preparing and planning for next year's ministries and events. We're already dreaming for what we're going to do for men's camp, for our St. Patrick's Day parade, for youth camp, Resurrection Sunday, and there's so many other things that we're already working on. Uh, we're trusting that you know the Lord can come back any day, but until that happens, we want to be busy as a church. We want to be busy trying to reach this community, reach the, the, our population here in Ballancolig and Cork and the surrounding areas. Uh, we want to, to reach people with the gospel before he does come back. And so we are trying as, as, as hard as we can as a church to, to not only just administer to outside people, but also to you and I. And uh, so as we are looking at next year, where do you see yourself being a part of? Where do you see yourself being a part of next year? Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Will you be a part of that vision that we have? Will you be a part of the activities that we have next year? We're pretty excited about what we have for next year's theme. Um, This year, we've been focusing on whatever happened to love. We've been focusing on love, the different aspects of love. I mean, love is far more complicated And uh, I've enjoyed this year learning about it, learning about the different aspects of it and how important it is in our lives as Christians. Well, next year, we're going to be learning about mighty to save. We're going to be learning about how God is mighty to save. Because Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So next year, we're going to be focusing on salvation just how important it is, just how easy it is to understand, and just how uh, powerful it is in our life. Um, So that's what we're going to be focusing on next year is our theme is Mighty to Save. Um, So not only should we desire a vision for your life, but be prepared for obstacles. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 9 again. Paul says, For a great door... And effectual is open unto me. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and there are many adversaries. Many adversaries. See, Paul recognized that God had opened a door for him in Ephesus. But he also acknowledged that with that door opening, that there was going to be some enemies, some adversaries, some obstacles, some hard things to overcome. Uh, Don't be surprised to face opposition when you desire to serve God. Opposition from your flesh, opposition from the world, and we're going to look at that here in just a couple of seconds. You see, the devil does not want you to serve God. He hates it. So he'll try everything he can to stop you. Um, You know, he'll use your flesh, the weakness of your flesh, you know, as we were talking about last month, the last time I was preaching up here, you know how much, you know, maybe you, you yearn to get up in the morning and spend time with God and, and you make that time and, and, uh, and all of a sudden you get up in the morning and, oh, it's really cold in the house. I'm really tired. Oh, I'll just put snooze on for a little bit more and, and I'll just rest a little bit longer. And, and pretty soon that time that you had hoped to spend with God is now gone. It's wasted. It's wasted by being in bed still and allowing your flesh to win. And, uh, and you know what? You could be very discouraged for the rest of your day. Instead of being discouraged, just realize, you know what? Lord, I blew it. I'm going to try again, though. And look and try to do the, and spend time with God the next morning. You see, the devil wants you to serve yourself, not God. Why do you think everything today is all about you. Everywhere you look, it's all about you. This is for you. Have it your way. Um, Because the devil is trying to take the focus off serving God to now serving ourselves. Taking care of ourselves rather than taking care and meeting the needs of other people. Taking care of ourselves rather than serving God. 
See, it's all about what you want and desire, not what God wants or desires from us. You know, we have a whole bunch of of people who rather they want to worship themselves when they come to church rather than worshiping God. You see, we are brands plucked out of the fire. See, we deserve to go to hell. Because of our sin, we deserve it. But yet God has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have switched sides, and now Satan is against us. Turn with me, if you would, to Zechariah chapter 3. It's the book of, uh, right before um, Malachi. So you go, if you go to Matthew and go back two books, that's Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. Now God is showing Zechariah a vision of Joshua. This is a different Joshua than the Joshua we know of with the the walls of Jericho. But in verse number 1, he says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing for the angel of the Lord. And look who was there to resist him. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So so the devil is standing right beside Joshua here to resist him in, in this vision. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused that iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair uh, mitter upon his head, so that they set a fair mitter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. As I look at this portion of Scripture, I see a born-again believer. You know, just like Joshua was standing there in those filthy, tattered garments, uh, when we came to Christ, we had those same garments on. We tried, to, we tried to be good. We tried to earn salvation through our own righteousness. And when God looked at us, all He saw was filthy garments, filthy rags. And, um, and so when, when we trusted Christ as our Savior, we were like that brand plucked out of the fire. You see, we were destined for hell. And yet, when we trusted Christ as our Savior, He changed our destination. We're no longer going to the fire. When we trusted Christ as our Savior, God gave us a new garment. No more are we dressed and and trying to be in our own righteousness. We are now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so when He looks at us, He sees the righteousness that Christ has more than our, uh, our filthy garments that we had. And uh, But the point that I want to look at here is that here Joshua uh, was going to be serving God as the high priest, and yet Satan was there to resist him. He wanted to stop him. He wanted to make it difficult. He wanted to make it a problem for Joshua to serve God. And that's a clear presentation of how he works today in our life. When we try to serve God, he wants to stop you. He wants to put obstacles in your way. He'll make it difficult. He'll make it hard. Uh, That's what Satan means, is adversary. That's what his name means, an adversary. That's that's what Satan means. So he wants to stop you. So when you try to serve God, he's going to make it difficult. Uh, That's why, you know, um, I've noticed that, you know, when when especially, um, you know, maybe going on the doors and, and someone says, you know, you knock on someone's door and say, yeah, I'll come to church. And maybe they were intending to come to church. But the devil throws some obstacles in the way and allowed them to make an excuse and saying, I'm not going to come. What excuses have you been making for why you're not serving God? Are you allowing the devil to throw some obstacles in your life to keep you from serving God? Because that's what he'll do. Not only is Satan our adversary, but we also, the world does not love God. And because they do not, they're against anyone who truly seeks to worship and serve Him. Turn with me to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. 
the middle of your Bible there. How often have we tried to serve God and it seems like that's when people seem to attack us the most? People that we love, people that are probably lost and they don't understand why we go to church, they don't understand why we serve God, why do we spend time uh, in our days to serve God. Um, it's because in reality the world is against God. So the Bible says that, that the world is enmity with God. It's at war with God. And those who are of the world, they're going to be against you as well. Psalm 109, verse number 1 says, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Here he's talking about, you know, here he's trying to serve God. His love is 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 God. And um says for my love, for my love for God, they are my adversaries. They attack him. I mean, look at it. it says they 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 open um the mouth of the wicked and the, the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Um they slander us, they lie against us, they lie about uh, about you. Um, they speak words of hate. And you wonder, what I do? How many times have you been there and say, what did I do to deserve this? It's not because of you, it's because of who you love. Because they're against God. And when you try to serve God, you'd be surprised at the reaction of, of people that, that you love. But here's the response that David had. Instead of lashing back out at them, instead of attacking them back, he says, but I give myself unto prayer. So no matter what they said to him, no matter how much they hurt him, he went to God in prayer. He gave it to God. He let God deal with it. Look at Psalm chapter 11. Psalm chapter 11. Verse number 2. <clears throat> For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Here David is also writing and saying, the wicked... They bend their bow. They, they, they prepare their bow to shoot at those who try to, to, to live right, to live godly. And whenever you try to serve God, be sure you're going to find obstacles. Be sure that the world is going to attack you for it because they just don't understand. But don't be discouraged when you're under that persecution, when you're under that obstacle, because it's, just, it's going to happen. Be prepared for it. That's why we need to be prepared for whatever's going to happen. You see, God knew that you would be in a fight. So He provided weapons and armor for it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. See, He knew that we were going to have obstacles. He knew that we were going to have adversaries. He knew that we were going to have opponents. And so rather than just leave us to, to flounder on by ourselves, He's actually provided weapons and, and armor for us to be able to equip ourselves and to be able to, to, to withstand against their attack. <clears throat> Look at verse number 10. Chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. God knew you were going to be in a fight, and so that's why He gave you these different weapons and armor to withstand the battle. Because He doesn't want you to quit. He knows it's going to be a challenge. He knows it's going to be hard. That's why we need to ask Him to equip us, so that way when we can withstand and go against the adversaries when we try to serve God. Lastly this morning, rejoice in the results. As we serve the Lord... God does allow fruit to come forth. As we continue to serve faithfully, fruit will be the increase. As we serve God, it could, we, could get, we could be so discouraged about how hard it is, about how difficult it is, and we don't look at the blessings. We need to look at the blessings because the blessings will get us through the hard times. The blessings will get us through the difficulties. The fruits of our labor will give us the victory to continue going on. You see, there is joy when you teach, when you minister to other people, and when you disciple others. Uh, turn with me to 3 John, right before Revelation. Small little book of 3 John. Look at verses 3 and 4. Here, John is writing to a church. Verse number three says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Verse number four says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, he's not physically talking about physical descendants of his, but of people that as he was helping out the church, people who had gotten saved, people who trusted Christ as their Savior, people he had been ministering to. And as he's looking back, he's saying, there's no greater joy that they're still serving God. And that is an encouragement to, to, uh, to pastors, to anybody who serves God together with you, when you're still serving God faithfully, that you haven't given up, that you haven't turned your back on God. That gives us joy. I mean, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you every Sunday, seeing you at Wednesday. Uh, it gives us joy to just to see you, see that you're still serving God, seeing that you still are, are in love with God. But it does also go for parents as well with their children. There is a great joy when your children are serving God, isn't it? When they're saved. When you know that um, just what God is doing in their life, you can look back and say, I don't deserve it, but I'm so thankful for it. It brings us joy when we serve God. Keep serving God even when it gets difficult. The end results are worth it. Look to Jesus as your example. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, just a few pages to the left. Jesus Christ is our example for everything. And it wasn't always easy for Jesus. You would think, well, He's the Son of God. Everything should be easy for Him. No, He had something very difficult that He could have easily given up on in His flesh. But He said, not my will, but yours be done. He's talking about God the Father. Look at verse number 2, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. When he was going through that Garden of Gethsemane, that was the hardest time that he had ever faced as a man. And yet, as he looked forward, the Bible says, and for joy, it wasn't the joy of having to be whipped to be crucified that he was looking forward to. He wasn't looking forward to the physical pain. What he saw was you and I. What he saw was the people who would be putting their faith and trust in him and turning away from their wickedness and their sin and a life of sin to God and changing their destination from hell to being with him in heaven for all of eternity. That was the joy that he saw. And as you minister to people, know that, you know what, no matter the hard stuff that you're going to go through, know that it's going to be, it's worth it. It's worth it, especially if you see someone get saved. Because the whole purpose of it is, is you have, they have changed their destination from hell to now going to heaven. And they'll be, be able to see them all, for all of eternity. It's worth every tear. It's worth every um, hardship that you go through. When you serve God, it refreshes and it encourages others to do the same. Look at Philemon, which is a couple of books, or a couple of pages to the left. Philemon chapter 1. It's the book right before Hebrews. Philemon chapter 1, verse number 4. Paul writes to Philemon, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Here he's writing to Philemon saying, what you do for each other, for the people that that you're serving, brings me joy. I'm glad that you're taking care of others, that that you're serving other people, that you're making an impact in other people's lives. And when you serve God, it encourages and refreshes others to do the same. And lastly this morning, everything we do for Christ is done together and rewarded by God. Turn to the the book of John, which is the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Just have a couple of scriptures this morning, then we'll be finished. John chapter 4, verse number 36. Actually, go to verse 35. Verse 35. Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He's talking about souls. He's talking about people that are out there who don't know Christ, that just are looking for someone just to tell them because they just don't know, and they're desiring to know God. Verse 36 says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. But both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors you see we're we're, it's all we're all working together you know what some may witness to somebody and you're laying a a foundation you're laying the seed that's in their heart the gospel and someone else may come along and and talk to them again about their need of salvation and and uh and watering that seed and maybe someone else a few years later comes and talks to them about their need for salvation and, and their heart's been under conviction since the last time that heard I don't know why it disappeared, but, um, oh, I think the computer died. Ah, okay. 
so the computer died. Um, and that fruit, that salvation, when that person turned towards Christ, that fruit was reaped, so to speak. And the Bible says that we all are rewarded. It's not just a person who maybe gets a chance to lead that person to Christ. We all are rewarded. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and this will be our last scripture this morning. First Corinthians three verses one through twelve <clears throat> it says, "And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it; neither yet now are ye able to." They hadn't grown since he had been there. They're still living in their carnality and their flesh. They hadn't grown to where they could do spiritual things. Verse 3 says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed not how he, might, he buildeth thereon. For a other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, oh, I think I'm going to finish there at verse number 11. I'm oh, sorry, verse 13. Now if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall, tra shall try every man's work of what sort it is. I'm thankful that it's not just all upon me that to do everything, but yet we all get to work together to accomplish the same goals. And that's what's so amazing as a church family, as we try to reach and to, and to minister to, to, to the, the people here in our community, that it's a joint effort. And, uh, and, the, and the Bible says that each person will be rewarded according as they labored. And uh, in conclusion this morning, can I ask you, do you have a vision or a dream or a desire to serve God with your life? Or are your dreams and desires just to serve yourself? Do you just react to situations around you? Or are you proactive in doing something with your life? You see, God didn't create you just to do nothing. He wants to use you if you'll just yield to His direction and let Him. See, He saved you because He loves you. But our desire should be to serve Him because we love Him. That should be the motivation of our service. He saved us. He, he went to the cross because He loved us so much. And it's just something little for me to give back to Him as my service to give my life for Him, to let Him to use me. It should be a show of our love for Him. Are you doing anything for the Lord? There are so many opportunities to serve God here. There are so many ministries and ways that you can be involved in serving God in this church. Where do you see yourself in this church next year? Are you going to just continue doing the same old, same old? Or are you going to try and serve God Maybe in other areas, or, um, or maybe just serve God, period, this year. But as you serve God, remember and be prepared for obstacles. They will come. And when they come into your life, remember you are never alone when you face them. You will never be alone when those obstacles come, because Christ liveth in you. 
The Holy Spirit's inside of you. He has equipped you with weapons and armor. He has prepared you. So when those obstacles come, fight on. Proceed on. But as you serve God, rejoice in the things that you get to be a part of. Encourage yourself. and Look around at the impact that your life has had on everyone else around you. You know what? If you weren't here this morning, people would have noticed. You're not a number. You're not just a number on Sunday morning. You are needed here. You're wanted here. Because you are an important part of this church. You're an important part of this family. But when things get difficult, keep serving God. Because it's worth it. The end results are worth every bit of sweat, every tear you shed. And lastly, this morning, we just want to thank you to everyone who does help. (laughs) Everyone who volunteers your time, your treasures, your talents for the Lord, for this church. This church couldn't be doing what it's doing without you. And we just want to say thank you so much. All the things that we showed in that video from this last year, very little could have been done without you. It wouldn't have happened. And all the different things that we got to experience and rejoice in, you had a part in that. Whether you were praying for the different events or uh, you were actively involved in them, either way, it wouldn't have happened without you. So thank you so much for being an important part of this church family. Let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer and we'll be finished. (laughs) Father, we do thank you so much for your love, your mercy. I pray, God, that you would, Lord, just um, give us a vision for next year. Put a desire in our heart, Lord, to serve you more than we ever have. And, Lord, I know it's easy to get discouraged when, it, when the adversaries, when the opponents come in our life. Lord, help us to remember and rejoice of the things that you've allowed us to see and happen already in our service to you. And I pray, God, that you would just encourage us, Lord, to do more for you this next year to spend more time with you, to to, uh, develop our relationship far more stronger than it was this year. Lord, help us to keep marching forward and not falling back. And Father, I do thank you again for all of our church family here. Uh, Lord, I'm so thankful and so blessed to be able to call my church family. And I just want to say thank you for each and every one. And Father, I do love you. In Jesus' name we pray.